most of these technologies, if they can destroy PFAS, they're destroying a lot of other emerging contaminants as well. Okay, so the very fact that we are focusing so heavily on this one particular class of compounds that is present at relatively low concentrations, and we're trying to develop technologies to remove those, that's going to pay dividends for even the compounds and the chemicals that we don't even know about yet. Welcome to Science with a Twist, a podcast for curious people who enjoy exploring how science impacts our daily lives. From technology that helps the fight against COVID-19 to solutions that help clean the water we drink is all thanks to science. In each episode, members of Thermo Fisher's scientifics team talk to experts who are on the cutting edge of redefining how we exist. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to Science with a Twist, brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. My name is John Lessica, and I serve as the president of chromatography and mass spectrometry here at Thermo Fisher Scientific. As part of my role, I lead a team partnering with researchers, pharmaceutical companies, food and industrial businesses, as well as government agencies. My team touches many industries to bring innovative technologies to laboratories across the world and enables the breakthrough science our customers bring to society. On this episode of Science with a Twist, I'm honored to be joined by Professor Dr. Lee Ferguson from Duke University. Dr. Ferguson's lab focuses on detecting, identifying, and quantifying emerging contaminants, including endocrine-disrupting chemicals and pharmaceuticals that are found in wastewater and drinking water. Using modern analytical testing techniques to develop methods for trace-level analysis with high-resolution mass spectrometry, Professor Ferguson's lab is at the forefront of environmental testing. In today's episode, we'll be discussing an emerging chemical contaminant of concern known as PFAS and Dr. Ferguson's water quality research in this field. We all know how important clean drinking water is. We look at the limited access to clean water in developing countries, the horror of any oil or chemical spill, and we can see media sharing the impact of these environmental calamities. One of the biggest buzzwords around water testing in the past few years has been PFAS. PFAS is a man-made forever chemical, and research has shown that PFAS are a major environmental and health concern due to their resistance to being broken down. We would like to understand how these compounds can have such an impact on our water systems and what it means for us as consumers and how testing our water supplies can benefit communities now and in the future. Welcome to Science with a Twist, Dr. Ferguson, and thank you for joining us. To start, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the work your lab is focused on, and if you can tell me a little bit about what inspired you. Yeah, sure thing, John. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to join you today. So for the last about 20 years, have been working on the issue of emerging contaminants in our water supplies. And as you said, you know, this is a major issue, not only here in the United States, but around the world. Emerging contaminants that pollute our water supplies are a real risk to our health. And so everybody, of course, has a right to clean water. So one of the things that's driven me over the past 20 years in my academic career is really trying to understand what we don't know about water quality and kind of dig deeper into some of the compounds and pollutants that might have been ignored up until now. And to do this, it's really been a journey from the beginning of my graduate days working in New York on contaminants in New York Harbor. I've really started to understand the, the important role that analytical chemistry plays in water quality testing. And this has really led me on a journey using a technique called high-resolution mass spectrometry, which, of course, your company is very heavily involved in. And so, of course, as you know, this is a technology that allows us to identify and quantify a broad range of potential emerging pollutants in water, even if we don't know what they are to begin with. And we call that non-targeted analysis. And this is something that, that we've been doing over the past really 10 years in collaboration with Thermo Fisher Scientific. And this has really helped us to position our laboratory as well as our community of scientists to be able to respond to issues like PFAS in our water supplies. Excellent. 
So I, I guess we'll start off with a, a real general question. Some of our viewers and listeners may not be familiar with PFAS. Can you give us a, a high level overview? Sure, absolutely. And so PFAS is an acronym, of course, and so it stands for per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances. And so for those of you who are not organic chemists by training, what that really means is that these are compounds that are man-made, they're synthesized in a laboratory, and they are unique because they have a high ratio of the element fluorine to the element carbon. So these are fluorocarbon materials. And so they were actually first made back in the 1940s. Uh, actually, Teflon was one of the very first developments of PFAS. And of course, Teflon is a polymer. And so some of the unique properties that made Teflon useful for lots of different industrial as well as consumer applications, all the way from you know seals in you know, nuclear weapons, all the way to the pans that you use on your stove, those properties also make the chemicals that are related to Teflon, the PFAS universe of chemicals, useful for lots of different consumer and industrial applications over the last 60 to 70 years. These include things like firefighting foam to put out fires that are started in, in fuels and, and solvents, stain repellents on carpets and textiles, and also things like mist suppressants to protect workers in chromium plating activities. All of these are sort of a, an embodiment of the phrase, you know, better living through chemistry. The only problem is that they aren't necessarily the best chemicals in terms of environmental stewardship. They're called forever chemicals for a reason, and, and that is because they do not significantly degrade under environmental conditions. So these, here's an example of, of chemicals that we make in our, in our production facilities, in our laboratories. When they get released out in the environment, they simply accumulate over time. And the more we make, the more they enter the environment, the, the more they're present. Now, maybe that wouldn't be such a huge problem if they somehow were sequestered in, in soils or sediments somewhere far away from human consumption. But the problem with PFAS that makes them relatively unique is that not only are they persistent, but they're extremely mobile. And they tend to be water-soluble, and they end up in our drinking water supplies. And they turn out to be very difficult to remove using conventional water treatment technologies. And this has really led to a huge increase in research and also public attention, frankly. So many questions that, that come to mind as you are talking. As I was mentioned to you offline, PFAS has really been a hot topic in, in the town I live in because of the levels that have been found in, in our drinking water. And, and I, you touched on it, that they really have tracked that back down to the fact that in my town for about 20 years, is where the Massachusetts firefighters were trained. And so they were using the, that, those fire suppressant chemicals. And, and unfortunately that's gotten in, into our drinking water. So you can have many people that are gonna be tuning in to, to listen to, to your uh, guidance here. Well, unfortunately, John, you're not alone. So the entire nation and really around the world is grappling with the issue of what's safe in our drinking water when it comes to PFAS and where did it come from, frankly? So, and this has become really a forensic deep dive into the intersection of environmental chemistry, analytical chemistry, and public health. And so it's, it's actually a pretty unique time to be an environmental analytical chemist. And so, you know, of course, I always thought that I'd become an environmental chemist and, and sort of live quietly in the laboratory for my career, but it really hasn't worked out that way recently <laughs> because of the issue of PFAS. This issue of contamination of groundwater and drinking water with firefighting foam, unfortunately, is is repeating all across the country. And so, you know, here is a balance between materials that are used for life-saving activities, but also might pose risk if they end up in drinking water supplies. I, building off of that, you know, so in, in your opinion, why, why is analyzing water for PFAS contamination so, so important? And what are some of the implications of contaminated water? Yeah, so, I mean, I think water is one of the things that we all require so all humans require water. We have to find a source of it. And so the sources of water to our drinking supply are, are really varied and diverse. And so it, this is an air, this is a exposure potential for PFAS that really touches all of us. So there are lots of other potential ways we can be exposed to PFAS through food, through contact with materials that contain PFAS, but we all have to drink water. And so because of the mobility and the persistence of PFAS, it's really, really important for us to understand this base level exposure that we could potentially have from our water supplies. 
we're still learning what it takes to remove PFAS from water once it's there. And we're also still learning what are the major sources and risks of PFAS to water supplies. The only way to tell whether there's a, a significant exposure risk in a particular community or a private well or, or a water supply is to test for it. And so this is actually somewhat challenging. There's a lot of nuances to the analytical chemistry around PFAS, and it's a learning curve. For those who are really beginning to do this kind of testing in the laboratory, it takes some time and it takes some expertise. Now, I know looking at your background and your career, you've, your research has taken you to many different places. How did you get into testing for PFAS? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. Well, so I really what, never set out to, to do PFAS research. In fact, I've known about PFAS since I was a graduate student. Back in about 1998 was when we started to be aware of things like PFOS and PFOA as potential contaminants. And I always paid attention to them because, of course, I could see that they'd be persistent. But I was really focused on trying to do emerging contaminant discovery work using this non-targeted analysis technology with high-resolution mass spectrometry. And then really about 2015, 2016, those worlds started to intersect. Here in North Carolina, we had a major source of contamination to some of the drinking water supplies in eastern North Carolina from industrial discharge from a floric chemical manufacturer. And so these were PFAS chemicals that nobody had thought to look for before. And so one of my colleagues, several of my colleagues here in North Carolina, used some of the technologies that, that we were also working on to identify some of these compounds. And this really led to a huge amount of attention and interest by both the public, the media, as well as ultimately the legislature into protecting our drinking water supplies. So I was asked to speak to the North Carolina legislature about, about emerging contaminants and how we protect our water supplies from them. You know, never did I expect I'd be up in front of the North Carolina legislature talking about mass spectrometry. This was really pretty, pretty wild. But in the end, what it led to was the creation of a consortium here in North Carolina called the North Carolina PFAS Testing Network. And then this was really a brainchild of myself and some colleagues to create a testing and, and environmental occurrence survey across all drinking water supplies for public supplies in North Carolina. And it's a huge effort back in about 2018, 2019, with all of the major universities across the state. And so we did that because unfortunately, since, as I said, PFAS testing is, is complex and the equipment and expertise required to do this is not typically found in most general water quality laboratories. The only resource we had in the state to be able to do this testing back then was the universities. So we basically pulled together in order to get a baseline of PFAS exposure potential in the state. And we were really the first state to do so. And so since then, PFAS has become a major focus of my laboratory, obviously, and we've really tried to marry that high resolution mass spectrometry based, you know, non-target discovery work with the focus on fluorinated PFAS chemicals. Building off of that, in in your research, your work, what's been the best way or the most productive when testing for PFAS? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. It's taken some, some ramp up in our laboratory, just as in others. I find that it's actually our most productive way to work is in kind of a hybrid approach where we have some of our laboratory devoted to doing what we call targeted PFAS analysis. And in that case, we know what we're looking for. We have a list of chemicals all right, so, so first of all, just to tell you, PFAS is not just one chemical. This is a, a universe of many possible compounds. You know, some say upwards of 3,000 to 4,000 potential chemicals. From a technological standpoint, it's actually very difficult to analyze all of those compounds simultaneously. So sometimes we prioritize, and we prioritize based on compounds, PFAS compounds that we know to be present or that we know might be present in a sample. And we can do a very accurate and very sensitive job of measuring those chemicals in water and in wastewater and in landfill leachates and other environmental systems. So our laboratory does a lot of that. We can do it really quickly. So we can turn around these analyses in a matter of hours, right? But then we also have an arm of our laboratory that works in still in the discovery mode where we'll take a sample and we'll let the sample tell us what's present. And so that's actually a lot 
more difficult than it might seem. You know, for those of you who might watch, uh, you know, NCIS or CSI, you know, you see the chemists go over to the instrument and they put the sample in and up pops the chemical name on the screen. I wish I had that instrument in my laboratory because unfortunately that's just not how it works. It's a lot of detective work. It's a lot of chemistry and it's a lot of understanding the informatics behind the system. So when we marry these two technologies together, we can do a much more comprehensive job of understanding all of the PFAS that are present in the environment. And that's how we approach our exposure assessments. I wish I had an instrument like that as well. <laughs> <laughs> You'd sell a lot of them. <laughs> so it just, you know, thinking about PFAS and, and the fact that it is all around us, what's, what's being done about PFAS contamination? Well, there's a lot of, of attention to this in many sectors. So those of us who are scientists and, and, you know, of course I'm, I'm an analytical chemist, but I'm, I actually sit in an environmental engineering department, right? So those of us who are in engineering, think about how to remove chemicals that are, are of concern from our, from exposure, right? So, and there's a number of, of approaches that are being used to address that. First of all, from the top, there's absolutely attention at the regulatory level. So the US EPA, you may have seen, has had lots of announcements recently about PFAS. There's been funding that's been allocated to help small drinking water systems um, ramp up their treatment technologies to remove emerging contaminants. That was actually a press conference here in North Carolina with, with the EPA administrator about a month ago. And also they've just released some draft maximum contaminant limit goals. These are enforceable EPA regulations specifying maximum levels of particular PFAS that are allowed to be present in drinking water. And the implications of these MCLs, as they're called, are huge. Because once the EPA specifies these MCLs as regulatory limits, then all drinking water supplies that are subject to those regulations will be required to test for PFAS and to ensure that the PFAS levels in their water are below those MCLs. And those MCLs, they, these numbers might not mean much to, to most of the listeners, but four parts per trillion for the individual PFAS that are regulated, that's incredibly low. That's one of the lowest, if not the lowest, maximum contaminant level for organic contaminants in water that's ever been issued. Okay, so EPA is taking this very seriously. So from the regulatory standpoint, that, that's helping to, to drive the improvements in drinking water treatment and protection there. There's also quite a lot of attention being paid to green chemistry and product stewardship. So companies are starting to feel the pressure, both from legal action, as well as from regulations that might be on the horizon. 3M, for example, has been a floor chemical manufacturer for many years. They have announced that they'll voluntarily phase out all PFAS production by, I think, 2025. So that's happening. And then at the engineering level, we're coming up with new and improved treatment methods for removing PFAS from a variety of matrices. Things like reverse osmosis, activated carbon treatment that can remove some PFAS from water systems. But more importantly, the biggest problem with PFAS is destroying it, right? So it's, it's one thing to remove it from water, but then you have to do something with it once you've removed it. So destruction technologies like supercritical water oxidation, like hydrothermal alkaline treatment and hydrolysis, these are Technologies are actually being developed by academic researchers in cooperation, in many cases, with government scientists. So uh, the DOD, for example, is funding a lot of research on this, especially because of the issues they face with firefighting foam contamination around the country. So I recently read an article that said, you know, over 96% of Americans have PFAS in, in their blood, which is staggering when yeah, you is. think about it. What can the average listener do to protect themselves from PFAS? Yeah, the scope of, of human exposure to PFAS really is pretty staggering. And I think it, it really speaks to how long we've been exposed to these chemicals, how pervasive they've become in our environment and in our consumer products. And so there's a number of things that the individual can do to reduce exposure. First of all, making good choices from, as a consumer, we'll do a couple things. First of all, it's gonna protect you potentially from exposure through consumer products. Okay, so good examples of ways to, to reduce that exposure and things that I do, for example. My 
kids and my wife always tell me I cook like an 80 year old grandmother. I, I use cast iron pots, stainless steel, you know, so no, no Teflon in the kitchen. You know, this is, this is one area drinking water treatment. Sure. You know, you don't leave it all to the water utilities. Um, so you choose a water filter that can help to remove PFAS. We've actually published some work on this. So activated carbon and mixed media filters, such as Brita filters can do a lot. If you really want to make sure that, that you're protected, then reverse osmosis under sink units work really well. Those are not cheap, but they're very effective. And then also in terms of the products that you buy, things like, um, like clothing that, that you know, try to avoid things that have stain repellent, you know, that are, that are fluorinated stain repellents on them. You know, so that does a, a couple of things. First of all, it protects you because you've, you've chosen a material that doesn't contain that material, but also it puts pressure on the manufacturers. So, you know, so the reason why these materials are used in products is because there's demand for it. So I think that the more that we can drive industry and the sort of commerce towards use of PFAS only in specific and very essential cases like medical devices, that's really going to help to reduce exposure for all of us. Excellent. So as we wrap things up today, any last inspirational words about PFAS testing or about the future? Sure. Yeah. I definitely don't want our listeners to, to go away with doom and gloom thinking about all the PFAS that they might be exposed to. I also want to make sure to get across that this is a really important time in our ability as scientists to understand exposures of emerging contaminants and contaminants in water and other media for our human population. So we have advanced our analytical capabilities to the point where we can see and, and measure compounds and environmental pollutants at very, very low levels. Okay, so that has led to an explosion in our ability to assess exposure. Okay, now as we've done that, and as we've found compounds like PFAS, that has led our researchers on treatment and removal technologies to come up with some of the best ways to treat water and treat other media to remove these contaminants. And so as we develop new technologies, both in drinking water treatment, wastewater treatment, as well as waste treatment technologies that can remove PFAS, most of these technologies, if they can destroy PFAS, they're destroying a lot of other emerging contaminants as well. Okay, So the very fact that we are focusing so heavily on this one particular class of compounds that is present at relatively low concentrations, and we're trying to develop technologies to remove those, that's going to pay dividends for even the compounds and the chemicals that we don't even know about yet that are in our water systems. So really, you know, I, I try to keep my eye on the ball here, thinking about global and holistic protection of our water supplies. And I think we're going to get there. I, I agree. That, that was definitely inspirational in the sense of how much benefit, frankly, we will come from PFAS and, and what we learn. And I also think it's raising the light on how important, like you said, drinking water is for everyone, no matter where you are in the globe. It, it's incredibly important. And there's a lot more focus around that now. Absolutely. I always say the best disinfectant is sunlight. So shine a light on it. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Dr. Ferguson, for joining us today. And more importantly, the work that your lab is doing to advance our understanding in environmental contaminants such as PFAS. Well, it's, it's my, truly my pleasure. It's obviously my passion. And thank you, John, for having me. And I hope your listeners learned something today. Definitely. Your passion comes across very, very strongly. <laughs> I've truly enjoyed being your host today. Thank you to Dr. Lee Ferguson for your time and the valuable work you're doing to further research around PFAS and advocate for change. We're excited to see advancements in this field and contribute to making the world a healthier, cleaner, and safer place. Until next time, this is Science with a Twist. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Science with a Twist. This show is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. If you enjoyed this episode, then follow Science with a Twist wherever you get your favorite podcasts.